Will everyone please take their seats? everyone please take their seats
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to ask. Buongiorno. Please take your seats. One, two, three. No. Would everyone please take your seats? Good morning, and on behalf of the European University Institute, welcome to the annual State of the Union Conference, 21st Century Democracy in Europe. We are extremely honored to be here again in Palazzo Vecchio for the ninth year in a row to facilitate discussion among academics, policymakers, journalists, and practitioners on issues of deep importance to our European Union. As our first speaker, I am pleased to invite Mr. Dario Nardella, Mayor of the City of Florence, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. President of the Tuscan Region, Mr. President of the European University Institute, professors, researchers, citizens, welcome to the Salone del Cinquecento. A special greeting to the diplomats, the representatives of other countries. It's always an honor, a pleasure for me to welcome you to Palazzo Vecchio for this event, which represents a crucial uh, appointment for the European debate, but even more so as we prepare to renew the Parliament and the Commission, the year 2019 is especially important for the political situation because there are parties, some parties and uh, that are attracting consensus as they criticize the European Union. Let me be clear, right from the very beginning, and I speak to you as mayor of the city, for our citizens, there is no better future than being a part of the union, uh, a union based on the values of democracy, widespread democracy, based on the rule of law, that protects peace, social equality, development, and sustainable well-being, uh, environmental protection, security, and an ordered uh, management of the migratory flows. The union is the way to interpret 
our results and to even analyze some of the errors and possible solutions available to us. We, a union of 28 different states, in some cases with a totalitarian past, is not easy. It has entailed mistakes, standstills at time, but it allows us to go back to the past where we find our roots and we will have to better interpret the future. If we're in the middle of the stream, we must cro continue our crossing and reach the other shore, the relationship between Europe and its democracy. Here's a thermometer. There's a bit of fever, if you will, and the fever that is felt in the territories, in the cities, on the one hand, we have a consensus, a strong consensus for the European Union, and there is a widespread awareness that we must be global actors in order to deal with the threats and outside competition. On the other side, there is frustration and participation. The citizens want to have total control of their local dimension, as well as accountability of the supranational uh, national processes. The European Union has always succeeded in synthesizing synthesize the, uh, on these distances. And I say this as the mayor. I am in the forefront in dealing with our citizens. And we feel the need for greater transparency, uh, better communication of the processes from the level of Brussels on downwards. The citizens must be able to understand how useful and important the community institutions are and how they apply to their daily lives. There's a a generational uh, implication in some of the disappointments. It concerns all those that have been excluded, those that have suffered only the negative effects of globalization. Yesterday, in the meetings at Villa Salviati, this aspect was often mentioned. Those who are too old for innovative positions or jobs and those who are too young, or women, because we still haven't attained gender equality. The relationship between the cities, the rural areas, must be rethought because there is a greater separation between the rural areas and the cities. At the same time, the peripheral areas. Uh, the suburbs in the large cities, the large European cities, uh, the, their needs are marginal. The inhabitants aren't listened to, they're not heard, they're not taken into account when the policies are planned. And yet uh, they reflect greater uh, marginalization. As the president of Euro Cities says, and this is the largest association that uh, brings together all the mayors of the European cities. I took part in drawing up the uh, manifesto. And we asked that there is, we must attain a more direct relationship between the community and our cities in order to deal with these many issues which are crucial and the relationship between the territories and the level, European level. Substantial democracy entails inclusion, the ability to reach everyone. And for this reason, I think that the European Union must review the democratic model based on a greater participation of the citizens. I believe it's vital to succeed in overcoming the traditional dichotomy between national states and the supranational level in order to make the 
European Union more inclusive and integrated. I'll never tire of saying that the union is made by the states, good and bad. This is why sometimes we are uh, irritated by the sovereignist uh, prescriptions. We, uh, in part, have forgotten the federal perspective. The presence of the European institutions in the territory and the role of the Conference of the Regions should be reinforced in order to draw closer to the requests of the citizens. This, too, is something that was indicated in the document signed by all the European mayors. Likewise, direct management of, greater f of the f greater funds from the European Union and the part of the local authorities would improve the relationships within the territory and the local institutions. It would reduce this equality between in the Union. Even, uh, and here we come to the regions and the cities. Uh, I spoke to President Rossi about this. We would have greater cohesion, greater recognition of the importance of the cities and local institutions, and for economic innovation of the European Union. Let's look at circular economy. The Parliament has worked a great deal on this, or collaborative economy, which is perfectly integrated in the local dimension. Many of the goals of the European Union, ambitious goals, can uh, be uh, uh, accelerated in their application through local policies. Greater involvement, therefore, at the local level of the European Union, the overcoming of this dichotomy between national states at the European level would help to neutralize, to uh, eliminate forms of uh, representation on the part of others. The, for, due to the uh, current complexity, we must uh, not only limit ourselves to the national uh, parliaments or to the European Parliament as it is today. We need legislative power. As Minister Moavero mentioned yesterday, even uh, denial of uh, the uh, transnational lists uh, proposed by the Italian government uh, has been a wasted opportunity. Nonetheless, I'd like to conclude with two issues that are dear to Florence, culture and the environment. Last November, we brought together the capitals of European culture here in Florence with Navracic, the European commissioner, and uh, many important things emerged. We passed them on to the European Parliament for social cohesion, integration, the role of our creative and cultural cities in order to have a European Union which is stronger from the cultural point of view as well. We cannot uh, cancel our identities, the identities of our countries and of the cities. Democracy without vital culture and an exchange among different identities is like a weak plant with weak roots. We have too much oversimplification of the concepts in communication. And I want to acknowledge the European University Institute for their role, not only scientific, but cultural role as well. And for this reason, I believe that greater investments in culture and scientific research would help eliminate the negative impact of a bad use of the social media instigation to hate, which has often poisoned the political debate in our countries. It will help us to be creative, more creative, to create new tools of economic inclusions. 
our citizens throughout all of Europe must have the intellectual tools in order to interpret the complexities of the times we live in and to shorten the national distances. A strong cultural element is the only way to guarantee this. So based on the results and the elements that came from the Conference of the Capitals of Culture, I have decided if I will have the opportunity to do this as the f mayor, I'm going to ca uh, uh, create the Creative City Expo where intellectuals, artists, all those uh, involved in culture can come to discuss their ideas, to show their achievements. We have a fertile terrain here with all the initiatives deriving from the State of the Union, the European Festival, for example. I'm glad that uh, the Ambassador Marca Del Panta is here, who, together with other members of the European Institute, University Institute, have given life to this event. And lastly, the environmental issue. The young people, our young people, remind us how important it is. These young people can't yet vote, but the health of the European Union will be measured by all those who can't talk today, but tomorrow they're going to inherit the world we leave them and the environment as we know has no political boundaries. And for this reason, we must all feel strongly involved and involved in this challenge of the century we live in, a challenge against climatic change. I thank you all for your attention, and I welcome you to our city and wish you the best of work today. I am now pleased to give the floor to Mr. Enrico Rossi, President of the Region of Tuscany. Good morning to all of you. In the country to rethink. I urge all members and regions of the European Union to recognize the intrinsic value and importance of our European family, our common purpose, and our community. This award was sent me by Gordon Matthew Thomas Sumner, more well known as Sting. This is a genuine letter from an English singer who has been living in Tuscany for many years. There are strong words that originate from an authentic European sentiment. I agree. I can't imagine my country and my region out of the European Union. Europe is present everywhere in Tuscany, not only in terms of investment, business, and the cohesion funds we receive, but also when we think about our own culture and history. I'm worried about this current wave of anti-European populism. There is too much fake news which is present in almost every country of Europe. To quote Sting again, this is the result of poor governance, lies and fantasies concocted by politicians seeking political opportunity in dividing Europe how true this sentence is. Permettetemi ora brevemente di... May I now move on to my language, um, which in these lands here in Florence, in Tuscany, had its origin. Florence, the homeland of the Renaissance, which contributed to the creation of our common European identity. 
I too would exhort all of you to react, to remember how essential Europe is and how present it is in all, our, in all of our lives. Over these months, I decided to visit city by city or country by country in my region, or that is area by area. The projects funded by the European Union, I assure you that there's no place nor any sector activity where funding from the European funds hasn't haven't arrived. The Florence tram line, as the Mayor Nardella well knows, culture, research, companies, social culture for young people, these are all examples, positive examples, where Europe has played a fundamental role. But Europe is not Im only important for its funding. It's even more important, much more important, for its strategies, for its regulations and directives. For example, in the environmental sector and for food safety, in social policies, but also concerning the fight against this, these incomes and for the protection of human rights and those fundamental right, which is freedom. Today, I think that this populist wave, it's no good saying we want more Europe. We need a fairer and a Europe with more solidarity, able to fight poverty and to protect the people who are weaker, young people, the elderly, workers, unemployed. In this way, we can defeat nationalisms and populisms. And those ideologies which are impregnated with hatred, with racism, which like ghosts s seem to re-emerge from the past, we do not want to go backwards. Thank you for your attention. We would now invite uh, the uh, President of the Florence Chamber of Commerce to make some remarks. Buongiorno. Good morning to everyone, and welcome to Florence. Also, on behalf of the companies of the metropolitan city, who through the Chamber of Commerce have contributed to some extent to the creation of the State of the Union 2019. I thank Mayor Nardella for their hospitality and the European University Institute. I thank them not only for these two days, but for all the precious work they're doing for all of Europe. Companies hope that the democracy of the 21st century will entail stability and opening. Only in this way will it be possible to work to the best of their abilities, not only to improve their process, but above all, to contributing to generating the GDP, which helps to redistribute income and to maintain social stability. Europe is the most beautiful home in the world. The previous generation created it with intuition, with passion. Our generation helped make it useful and efficient, and yet we have problems. This year, for the first time, millions of young people are going to vote. I believe in them. My hopes are with them. They have not known boundaries and walls. They consider uh, freedom of movement, study, work, research as a natural thing. We can't lose this generation. We must involve them in even more so in order to avoid, uh, to help overcome the risk of the death of Europe. I would love to see them uh, involved as teams in guiding the European institutions. It's evident that Europe needs to govern the problems with the strength of their roots, with the ideals of history, and the strength that comes from the new generations. Hooray for Europe. I am now pleased to invite Professor Renaud de Hoos, President of the European University Institute, to welcome you to this year's conference in Palazzo Vecchio.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome you once more on behalf of the European University Institute to this uh, State of the Union conference. Why is an institution like the European University Institute engaging in uh, the organization of such an event? The answer is simple. First, it is our duty as any European institution to explain that somehow we add value to the many things that are already generated by our member countries. And secondly, it is, as was said by the previous speakers, we are in a moment where the European project is subject to growing contestation. We need to think about that. We need to engage in discussions with stakeholders of all kinds at the national and the European level on uh, the issues which have been uh, addressed uh, repeatedly uh, in uh, the recent uh, months and weeks uh, in European debates. That's the first uh, rationale for this exercise. But there is a second one which is equally important. It is crucial for us as, dare I say, a local institution to relate to our neighbors. Uh, we have been created and we have grown for uh, four decades in the beautifully uh, stimulating uh, uh, environment uh, that was uh, put at our disposal by the Italian state. We have somehow to pay our debt by uh, engaging in a, a never closer union, uh, allow me to put it that way, uh, with uh, local actors in uh, debates of the kind we are going to have uh, today. Colgo anche l'occasione che mi è data per rinnovare. I want to take this opportunity to express our gratitude, not only to the city of Florence, to the Tuscan region for their uh, reception. But I want to thank the Italian state as well for having renewed their trust in us by granting the Institute Palazzo Buontalenti in the center of Florence for the startup of another important project, not only for the Institute, but I believe to renew training and offered at a European level. Without their support, the Institute would not have been able to develop as it has developed. Naturally, it's going to be our duty and an honor for us to exchange their courtesy by promoting debates such as this and such as the one that was held yesterday that has given an, a year, uh, increasingly European image of Florence. I thank all our partners for having made this initiative possible and I wish you the best of success with your discussions today. Thank you. We are honored to welcome Italy's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Enzo Moavero Milanese, to make an address at this year's State of the Union. Ladies and gentlemen, 
authorities, dear mayor, president of the region, the prefect. It's a traditional meeting, this in Florence, under the auspices of the European University Institute, to enable us to reflect about Europe, to reflect about this important achievement of the second after the Second World War, which coexists with us and which we often discuss about and we often meet about, we meet and we often divided about, as happens for all major questions. I believe that the fundamental point of our thoughts that we began yesterday in the framework of the various round tables organized by the European University Institute is the matter of which is a very current matter which has accompanied us since the beginning of the process of European integration. What kind of Europe do we want? To ask what type of Europe do we want does not mean at all asking if we want or or if we don't want integration of the European states, if we want to preserve it. What it means, and I think this is healthy and natural, to ask about how to reform it in order to make it more effective. We have behind us almost 70 years of European integration. Everything began with the declaration by Robert Schuman from the French uh, minister to Germany, putting in common what had split the two countries in the two world wars, which were a big European civil war, and the 30 years war, which has torn our continent. With these integrations, there were four other countries, three of them geographically in an obvious fashion, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg. There were amongst and the, the two, France and Germany, France and Germany, and then Italy. Uh, less obviously, the first community that began was the uh, coal and steel community, uh, coal and iron, although present here in this beautiful region of Tuscany, are not resources that our country has in abundance. But the far-sightedness of those governing us, them, and those the early 1950s in that difficult post-world period, uh, joins Italy to the first countries of the European Union, and there a European process begins, an Italian process in, it, in Europe. It's very significant, and there's high participation. We need to be aware of this with that awareness that it's normal for anyone attending or taking part in these important events. Certainly, Europe has built successful results. The first, we take it for, for granted. Peace, peace in Europe, 70 years of uninterrupted peace between the European states, uh, something that's unique in history. It may seem obvious, natural, almost commonplace, but in fact, it's a fundamental result. And on peace, we built a strong, economic collaboration, compenetration of the, our economies. We've built a legal system, which is very important in sectors uh, like the environment, health, industry, trade, which are our daily bread. And it's a Europe that's concrete, substantive. We heard this in the previous speeches. We've heard this exam these examples given about the points of arrival of Europe, the European results. These are examples of very substantive features. This substantive Europe has brought its results. The world changes, the world is changing around Europe and within Europe. 
the needs of European citizens change. Naturally, the needs of the immediate post-war period were very different from today's needs, and those needs and the need on the part of the European Union and of Europe to keep up with the times and to reform. This needed to be done, and this is my personal opinion. Some years ago, in particular, a great review of uh, institutional review of Europe and some of the uh, founding elements of Europe should have been begun straight after the uh, over the overwhelming geopolitical change at the end of the 1990s when the Iron Curtain fell and that division of Europe into two which had lacerated the first decades of the post-war period. And this didn't happen. And this undoubtedly on hindsight, but perhaps we could already identify this. Some people already saw it. This was an error. But nonetheless, citizens, the European residents are asking us to reform Europe. In particular, if we look at that useful thermometer of the uh, of the European state of mind, the Eurobarometer, which is published by the institutions in Europe, we see today's concerns. There's a big concern about these huge migratory flows, and there's great worry about uh, employment and work and labor, all these social subjects that Europe has neglected over the years. There is a concern for safety for security, and there's a worry about climate change and for the environment. These clear indications from the citizens must make us give us a substantive answer, not just proclamations, plans which are not put into practice. These are not a concrete response. We need much more. We need to review the institutional architecture of Europe. It's pointless to say that we are following a federal path. We are ideally uh, along a federative path of Europe, but to reach this federation, we, we need new treaties, specifically and explicitly federal, to be submitted to all Europeans for their approval. This is a complex process since we know how difficult it is to negotiate the existing treaties and to have them approved and ratified, have them approved by citizens and ratified by parliaments and suggesting them to the various countries who are transposing them. But there are some features that need to be carried out now, right from today. and. We need to see these European reforms that I believe are significant. We would be helped by this vote for the European Parliament that we will all be taking part in in a few weeks' time. This is finally a European cross-border debate with the bitterness of the, the political debates. It's good that it should be carried out in this harsh, rather tense manner. And personally, I think it should be with mutual respect and it should there should be this uh, heated political dialectic. But the fact that we are talking seriously about different visions of Europe is Europe is a way to talk democratically about the future of Europe. And it's good that these different views should come to light, come out and be expressed. And so the European people can express their vote. So it's a proportional vote in all European countries, which will enable us to see exactly what the positions are. This new European Parliament that we are ready, we're about to elect would be able to contribute to changes, significant reforms from the point of view of public policies and certain institutional adjustments that can be adopted with the current treaties without uh, undertaking the uh, 
uh, unavoidable uh, big reform which will have to take place eventually of the under the basic treaties. Yeah, as I was saying yesterday when I spoke um, at the European University Institute, the State of the Union, may I make five substantive proposals that I believe can change the situation the way the European Union works already today. The first is the role of the European Parliament. It's a legislator in almost all sectors. The European Parliament has an essential role in the production of new rules that we affect us daily because they come into force very quickly with the transposition of the directives and the application of these rules. The European Parliament that we have been elected for 40 years, this year is the 40th anniversary from 1979, universal direct, universal suffrage. It has no legislative initiative uh, uh, because the treaty uh, envisages this. It's for the Commission. This must be overcome, and I think it can be overcome immediately through an inter-institutional agreement between the institutions, explicit, put down in writing in the proper form, as is already done for many sectors at the beginning of the European legislation. And it involves, in particular, the European Parliament and the Commission, according to which the Commission undertakes to take over and to therefore present out of respect for the uh, what is envisaged in the treaty, all the legislative proposals prepared by at least one parliamentary group in the European Parliament or by a number of MEPs, uh, transversal to these groups, which corresponds to what the treaty pre uh, prescribes. We're talking about 25 European uh, Euro uh, Parliament groups. We've got these over 700 members of the European Parliament that we are about to elect. It should not just be there to amend or to not to accept or change something proposed elsewhere, but it can itself propose uh, European regulations. The second proposal is concerns the nature of the Commission. The political debate for the election of the Parliament is a heated one. It's a lively one. We know that there are different positions. The Commission, the European Commission has fundamental executive tasks, should be appointed on the basis of a majority vote by the European Parliament. I think that if we wish to talk seriously about a political commission, the European Commission should be the expression of the majority in the European Parliament, and it should correspond to the majority that sits on the on the seats of the European Parliament. This is very important in order to have that work hand in hand, the representative parliament, parliament of representing people and the executive which should carry forward these policies. The third concerns the union's budget. Without a budget, no organism will work in the best possible way. Naturally, the European Union, like any other institution or any other organism, starting with condominiums where we live, lives with a budget. And the next European budget, uh, the next parliament, uh, will take care of ending, terminating these negotiations on the, the um, pluriannual budget 2017, which will be passed during these events. Every budget has expenses and a lot of discussion goes, out, goes on about how to uh, allocate this expenditure, but too often we ignore, we neglect the question about the revenues, about the income. There isn't a serious discussion about the budget unless we discover, uh, dis discuss how this budget is nourished or everyone talks about VAT that we pay when we buy goods or services and the customs duties, the entrance of goods from countries outside the European Union into the European Union. The rest of the budget consists of payments from states in proportion to the national uh, gross national income, which is, corresponds more or less to the 
gross domestic product, and that corresponds to what they've received from their taxpayers. I think that the budget of the European Union should be given and should have and should draw from other types of resources, our own resources, genuinely European resources. And I'm thinking of two types of possible resources. The first is the possibility for Europe, as happens for all of us when we have to um, face ex important expenses like buying a house or we go to a bank and a credit institution to ask for a loan. Europe can ask the markets for funding through uh, debit uh, European bonds. These one or two percent of this, uh, this European gross in domestic product would treble the current budget, which corresponds now to 1% of the sum of the uh, gross domestic product of the member states. What are these bonds for? To fund investment projects, not to fund an unclear expenditure, but to fund these investment projects. And these would free up resources because much of the European's budget it funds these investment uh, in research and technological innovation and major trans-European interconnections with structural funds for the less developed areas. And this is the first important resource could be decided in agreement between the institutions and in particular the parliament. And the second major resource, which would uh, project onto a bigger scale, what is already done for VAT, the institution of forms of European taxation that don't weigh, I, I stress this, that do not weigh on those who regularly pay in completely their taxes for their own income and their consumption, each in their own country, but which affect subjects which, because of their size, the type of activity, the way they operate, they are managed to de um, pay their income tax where, where tax is lower, or they can create situations which may not be positive for the rest of the community or which they attribute their incomes to group leaders that have their headquarters in states which have tax benefits or tax easement. And so it needs, we need to have unanimity in order to do this. And perhaps that's why there hasn't been this agreement. Taxes on these harmful emissions, carbon tax or CO2 tax, taxes on the group leaders, taxes on these big web leaders who uh, are making profits uh, in individual states, and these paid to the budget, this amount of taxation paid to the budget would give us important resources which would enable us to undertake new policies, be more active in the environment, and to have aid from the countries where um, in aid to countries where the migrants are leaving from and to fight against unemployment. My fourth proposal concerns immigration policy. Europe cannot be so negligent. Europe cannot leave to geography or the choose of choice of human traffickers the arrivals or the burdens to support this and it cannot be left to some countries. We are affected in Italy because many of these passages come through the Mediterranean Sea. Europe must do more policy at several levels. You need to take action in the countries of origin, the countries of transit, and we need to help the countries that migrants come from with a big plan for Africa with many resources. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. We need to fight against human traffickers, and we must share the burden linked to the possible concession on the right of exile for people Oh, I'm sorry, the right of asylum to people who've asked for asylum. This is a big European action, and 50% of the citizens interviewed by the Eurobarometer believe this. 70% believe that there is not a sufficient policy. A big and important migration policy must be launched, possibly, hopefully, under the impulse of the new Commission, the new Parliament. I'm thinking of the fifth proposal, which concerns foreign policy. I was able to meet uh, uh, find this in serving the country. The current foreign policy of the European Union is 
evanescent. People perceive this feeling of insecurity. Says Europe is not present where Europe should be present to help peace. They see lots of hesitant hesitation, and a lot of this depends on the fact that each member state is extremely jealous of their own foreign policy. This is one of the strong points of these residues of sovereignty which affect every country, none excluded. Another reason is linked to unanimity. Decisions are taken only when there's a unanimous agreement, only with agreement between states. We could be able, we could decide to proceed, make decisions with a majority vote. I think that these are concrete suggestions which could help us to take a step forward. We must not think that there is a real dispute about the foundations of the European Union. No, no one except some marginal elements in the political framework would imagine this. No one imagines real returns to the small national states. We would make the errors of the Italian states of the, of the 16th century, which was a magnificent period for our country but they didn't understand what was happening in the world after the discovery of America. The world is not disputed in its foundations, but in its functioning. There are different ideas. Let's try to join them together and to have discussions and find a path which will enable us to improve it considerably. We contribute, we try to give our contribution, and as the president of the European U University Institute said about the building, Palazzo Bontalenti, it was voted by the parliament with no votes against. Thank you, and I wish you a successful continuation today. I am pleased to introduce Professor Hans-Peter Kriesi, Stein Rothen Chair of Comparative Politics at the European University Institute, to deliver the annual State of the Union Address. Good morning. It's a great honor for me to speak to you this morning about the question whether there is a crisis of democracy in Europe today. Now, I, I, uh, I already went too far. Is there a crisis of democracy in Europe? There is an accumulation of crises in Europe. The Euro crisis, the Brexit crisis, the refugee crisis, the rise of strongmen and illiberal Democrats in Central and Eastern Europe, and of populist challenges in Western Europe. Against this background, there is also a pessimistic debate among observers on the crisis of Western democracies more general. Already some years ago, Wolfgang Merkel cautiously talked about an erosion, not crisis, of democracy. Larry Diamond identified a democratic recession, and Mark Plattner saw democracy on the defensive. Last year, the titles of the books about democracy have become more alarmist. Sascha Munk titled The People versus Democracy, and Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt they wrote about how democracies die, and David Runciman very similarly wrote about how democracies end. I'm getting older, and I remember the time when I was a student back in the 1970s. People also talked about a crisis of democracy, and the crisis talk came from the right and it came from the left. From the right, it was claimed by the Trilateral Commission that Western democracies suffered from a demand overload and had become ungovernable. 
and from the left it was claimed that they suffered from a legitimacy crisis from which they could not uh, which could not be resolved now this crisis talk at the time triggered a big comparative research project the belief in government project which 20 years later delivered its results which showed that western democracies were perfectly capable of absorbing the increasing pressure coming from the citizens and they were also capable of absorbing the new types of uh, political expressions which were used to exert this pressure unfortunately for the authors of the study nobody cared anymore when their results were published because in the meantime the berlin wall had fallen people had moved on and pundits even declared the end uh, the end of history is this time different are we heading this time for the real crisis of democracy i put my cards on the table right away i side with the economist as you see claims about a year ago that reports of the death of democracy are greatly exaggerated but the least bad system of government ever devised is in trouble it needs defenders and what i shall try to do i shall provide arguments for defenders from four perspectives the first perspective is the bird's eye perspective of the long-term trends worldwide the second perspective is the perspective of the citizens and their support and dissatisfaction with democracy the third perspective is the perspective of the voters who are responsible for the rise of populist challengers as a reaction to their democratic dissatisfaction and finally the fourth perspective will be the perspective of the elites and we'll address the question what happens if populists get into power now the bird's eye view of the centennial trends and i will show you the centennial trends based on vdem data these are swedish data the best data that exists currently about the trends in comprehensive democracy and its electoral participatory and liberal components here it is you have the trends from 1900 to 2016 and you have the trends for uh, comprehensive democracy and the three components and what you see is that all these trends point upwards so worldwide democracy has been rising it is true that in the 2000s they reached a plateau and since the 2010s there is a slight decline in the worldwide trends so it is this decline that has been addressed by arguments about democratic recession but no two things first of all this decline is limited and it takes place on a very high level of democratization and the theorists of modernization theory tell us that worldwide the values in which democratic support is rooted are actually increasing and spreading so we can count from the point of view of modernization theorists on a resumption of these trends which brings me to my second perspective the citizens perspective ever since Armin and Werber's uh, civic culture we know that stable democracies require supportive attitudes and norms if the people hold democratic values democracy will be safe now Levitsky and Ziblatt have some doubts about this because even if citizens can elect their governors they cannot control their government governors once they are in power and it might well be that these governors will do things that the citizens do not like I focus now on Europe and I show you the European support for democracy based on a very simple question the question is in general how important is it for you to live in a country that is governed democratically zero not important at all 10 
extremely important. And I will show you the average support by European region, the Nordic countries, Western Europe, that is the Anglo-Saxon Isles plus Northwestern continental Europe, Southern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and hybrid democracies, countries like Russia, Ukraine, and Kosovo, which serve as a benchmark. Here are the averages. You see, the Nordic countries lead the pack with an average of 9.2, very close to the maximum of 10. So all, almost everybody in the Nordic countries thinks democracy is extremely important. But note that also in the other regions of Europe, the averages are very high. So even in the hybrid democracies, Russia, Ukraine, and Kosovo, the average is far beyond the midpoint of five. So uh, in Europe, across Europe, we can count on the support of citizens of the principle of democracy. You might say that this indicator is a bit rough and ready, but even if you use more sophisticated indicators, you will find very similar results. Now, of course, support of principles is not the same thing as evaluation of what real existing democracies are like. And here I have another very simple indicator. How satisfied are you with the way democracy works in your country? Zero, extremely dissatisfied. Ten, extremely satisfied. There is, of course, a discrepancy between ideals and reality. And I show you also the discrepancy on average. So average satisfaction with minus average support. Now, some people say this discrepancy points to a democratic paradox because people support democracy, but they are dissatisfied with what they get. I don't think this is a paradox. I think it's natural, normal, that expectations are not met by reality and that people are not getting exactly what they desire. And this is also the case with democracy, as you will see here. The first column is the same as I showed you before. The second one is average satisfaction. And the third column is the average discrepancy. And you see. Even in the Nordic countries, there is a discrepancy, and even in the Nordic countries, there is room for improvement. But uh, things are very bad in Southern Europe, where the discrepancy is twice as large as in the Nordic countries. Things are also bad in Central and Eastern Europe, and of course, in hybrid democracies, where lower expectations are not by far not met by reality. So where does this democratic dissatisfaction come from? Arguably, it has to do with a crisis of representation. And I would uh, suggest that this crisis of representation has two versions. What happened? Ah, here you have the two versions. First version is the lack of responsiveness of the parties to new demands of the citizens. The voters or the citizens' demands are rooted in social conflicts. And for some reasons, which I cannot go to here in detail, the mainstream parties have chosen to neglect some of these very important new conflicts, which led, I think, to dissatisfaction, especially in Northwestern Europe. On the other hand, there is, uh, and I can also cite Sting with the president of Tuscany, uh, there is performance failure, traditional performance failure, which has been very serious in the time of the Great Recession in Southern Europe in particular, but also in Central and Eastern Europe. So the economic crisis has led to enormous, uh, and the way it was handled, 
has led to enormous uh, dissatisfaction in economic terms, but also in political terms in Southern Europe in particular. Southern Europe has suffered from a double crisis, an economic and a political crisis. And the political crisis in Southern Europe was linked on the one hand to foreign interventions, the Troika uh, and others have not been uh, well received and uh, also from domestic reasons which have to do with corruption, scandals, and sheer incompetence. Now, what is the consequence of democratic dissatisfaction? This question brings me to the third, to the voters' perspective. The voters have reacted to their democratic dissatisfaction, and on the one hand, they have uh, led to their decisions have led to a decline of mainstream parties and increasing volatility in the party system. On the other hand, they have uh, chosen increasingly populist challenger parties from the left and from the right. First, I show you the decline of the mainstream parties. The black columns, uh, they show you the decline of mainstream party vote since 2008, since the beginning of the economic crisis, on average in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, Northwestern Europe, and Southern Europe. And you see that the decline of these parties is most pronounced in Southern Europe. So Southern European party systems have uh, greatly transformed since the beginning of the economic crisis. Volatility tells more or less the same story. These are the gray columns. You see volatility has been by far uh, the biggest in Southern Europe. It has also been uh, increasing in uh, Northwestern Europe and actually it has been declining in Central and Eastern Europe. So from a very high level in Central and Eastern Europe, actually party systems are more consolidating, but in Southern Europe they are falling apart and in, cent uh, in Northwestern Europe, they are changing at the more uh, slower pace. Who is benefiting? Here you see it very clearly. I show you that the, the figure only for Northwestern and Southern Europe. You see the increase of the radical left and the radical right in Southern Europe and the increase of the radical right in Northwestern Europe. Surprisingly, the radical left in Northwestern Europe has been stagnating in spite of the economic crisis. In Northwestern Europe, the challenges increasingly come from the radical right, while in Southern Europe, the challenges mainly come from the radical left. And I must admit, uh, I, I added Cinque Stelle, Movimento Cinque Stelle, to the radical left in order to prepare this picture. Now, Italians might not agree with this choice, and some might say, with the Cinque Stelle themselves, we are neither left nor right. But I would claim, and I have been claiming that uh, for a, a while, that actually the Movimento Cinque Stelle is the functional equivalent of Podemos in Spain and of Syriza in Greece, so it is, and it increasingly shows to be, I would claim, to be a force rather from the left than from nowhere. Now, this is a very important point which I would like to stress. The new populist party, whether from the left or the right, pursue a double logic. On the one hand, they express and fuel democratic dissatisfaction. They are populist parties. That is, they mobilize against the elites. Cinque Stelle is mobilizing against da casta. They have strong emotional appeals against the mainstream parties. They demand popular sovereignty. They think uh, uh, the established elites have committed treason uh, for the people and they want to re-establish the power of the people. On the other hand, these parties also express substantive conflicts. So they are rooted in social conflicts and the radical right is rooted in an opposition to immigration, 
in opposition to European integration and to some extent also to cultural liberalism. It is expressing a very important new social conflict between nationalist conservatives and cosmopolitan liberals. And the radical left is formulating opposition to rising inequality. It is mobilizing in support of social protection, of redistribution. It articulates a renewed conflict about material and I would say class interests. Now what does that mean? That means that independently of political satisfaction, substantive demands which are rooted in social conflicts contribute to the electoral success of these parties. So as long as these social conflicts are important, these parties will gain in intellectual, electoral terms. On the other hand, it means that democratic dissatisfaction contributes to the success of these parties independently of social conflicts. So the democratic dissatisfaction, which is rooted in political dynamics, might change once the political dynamics change. And one moment when the political dynamics change is when these parties get into government. Then it has been shown across very different countries in Western Europe, when these parties get into government, political dissatisfaction among their constituencies is strongly reduced. So their constituencies are more satisfied when they are in power, and which means that they will reduce their populist claims, and in the long run, they will maybe become parties like all the other parties. Is the rise of these parties dangerous? Now, there are those who say that populist challengers articulate a democratic corrective. And actually, Margaret Canovan has always pointed out that populists aim to cash in democracy's promise of power to the people. And populists see themselves as the best defenders of democracy. And you could claim that they actually do in several ways. They expand the political agenda. They expand the political debate. They put key societal conflicts on the agenda which have been neglected by the other parties. In so doing, they increase the options for the electorate. There are actually alternatives, contrary to, contrary to what Angela Merkel or Margaret Thatcher have suggested. And they increase uh, electoral participation in doing so. For example, in the German Landtag elections, with the participation of the AfD, electoral participation has importantly increased. And in the Brexit uh, referendum, it participation has been larger than in the last British general elections. Now, this brings me to the elite perspective and to the question what happens if populists are in government. Because all is not well with the populists, as we know. And there are uh, very strong voices which say that the real danger occurs when populist leaders get into power and attempt to implement their project of political renewal, which is, given their illiberal vision of democracy, which is an illiberal project of power. I would claim that this danger depends on two factors, on the populists, populist leaders themselves and on a series of constraints which I would, uh, to end my talk, briefly discuss with you. The first set of constraints are institutional. There are the checks and balances, and President Trump has met with the limiting power 
exerted by courts and uh, by Congress, who is now dominated by the opposition party. There are especially electoral systems. This is an aspect which has often been overlooked, but in Europe, most countries have proportional electoral systems. And what does that mean? That means that no party, or very rarely a party, gets power undivided. And that means that parties in government have to form coalitions with other partners, and these coalition partners usually exert a moderating influence on them. Second, there are partisan constraints. Parties, say Levitsky and Ziblatt, are the ultimate gatekeepers. And they distinguish between loyal, disloyal, and uh, semi-loyal oppositions. Now, the semi-loyal ones are the really dangerous ones. They are the ones who look away, ignore, tolerate, condone, or even justify the dealings and wheelings of the populist leaders. And uh, President Trump's takeover of the Re Republican Party is, of course, the prime example of what happens if semi-loyalists don't react. Another example from the Europe closer to home is the way the European People's Party has been dealing with the challenge by Viktor Orban. Take as a contrast example South Africa, where Zuma's replacement by uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, arguably after a long time of toleration, but uh, finally Jacob Zuma has been replaced, shows that parties can remove maverick leaders, and they do so. There are international constraints, international leverage and linkage, and we know that uh, European conditionality for the new members uh, imposed on them the acquis communautaire and imposed on them uh, democratic uh, institutions, which uh, we know, uh, which uh, ha have been uh, functioning in most countries. But we also know that disciplining members uh, once they are in has been much more difficult, as has been illustrated by the Hyder affair some years ago, and has been re more recently illustrated with the difficulties of Europe with Orban and with Kaczynski. There is also the market which imposes constraints. And in Italy, we know this very well. Lo spread, the difference between uh, in, uh, interest rates paid for German bonds and Italian bonds is a very important or has been a very important disciplinary mechanism as we know from what happened last year is with the government formation of the government we have now in Italy. The most important constraint, however, is exerted by the voters. Democracy is unique in having a mechanism for self-correction. The voters can vote the rascals out. Now, they don't always do that. In Hungary and Poland, Turkey and Russia, voters have confirmed would-be autocrats. And we cannot be sure that voters will exert their power. But sometimes they do. Last year, there have been three uh, important cases, Armenia, Malaysia, and the Maldives, three cases where uh, would-be autocrats have been sanctioned and ousted by popular resistance. And the election of uh, Susana Kaputova in the more recent, the spring, Slovakian presidential election shows that even in Central and Eastern Europe, illiberal Democrats cannot go on forever. Turkey, the local elections in Turkey this spring show that voters can put limits, uh, even only at the local elections, to an autocrat like Erdogan. 
And uh, the Ukrainian presidential elections, the most recent elections, show that uh, complete outsiders have a chance against established oligarchs. Now, there are differences in Europe with respect to populists in government. In Northwestern Europe, the radical right has been in power or supporting power in several countries, for example, Norway and Switzerland, but in others as well. And the constitutional and partisan constraints have exerted a moderating effect on these parties. In Southern Europe, similarly, uh, the radical left in power has been moderated by constitutional and by partisan constraints, as well as by international and uh, market constraints. Now, international market constraints have not been very democratic in these countries, but they have exerted an important disciplinary power. It is in Central and Eastern Europe where the situation is most problematic, because uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, the institutional and the partisan circumstances allow populists to get power undivided. They govern, v admittedly, with uh, some coalition partners, but uh, they are by far the most dominant party in government, and they can uh, wheel and deal as they please. So let me come to my conclusion. Overall, there is reason for concern, but no reason to dramatize. To be sure, there is widespread dissatisfaction with democracy in Europe, especially in Southern and Central and Eastern Europe. But there is also widespread support for the democratic ideals. We are dealing with dissatisfied or with critical Democrats, and that's something different from autocratic citizens. Democratic dissatisfaction, to be sure, gives rise to challenger parties which express this dissatisfaction and articulate legitimate substantive concerns and offer alternatives. In Western Europe, Western and Southern Europe, once in government, challenger parties tend to moderate and the dissatisfaction of their voters tends to evaporate. It is in Central and Eastern Europe where the situation is most dangerous, where illiberal leaders get power undivided in a context of weak democratic traditions. And as an afterthought, the idea I have already mentioned, the populist challenges may be just a temporary phenomenon, characteristic of a crisis of representation and of a restructuring of the party system. Once these new conflicts become the dominant forces in structuring the party systems, these parties, I would predict, will become the new mainstream parties and replace the old mainstream parties in the framework of representative democracy. Thank you for your attention. We do have time for one or two questions if someone would like to uh, ask one. There is somebody. Yes, thank you, Lano from CEPS and Brussels. I just wondering when I heard you speaking, the Spanish elections from this weekend were probably a bit a demonstration that democracy can be resilient if you go back to the basis of democracy. I agree with you. The Spanish elections of this weekend have been very interesting and from my point of view, they show that this conflict which is articulated by or has been articulated by the radical right in Northwestern Europe for almost four decades now 
is now becoming more important in Southern Europe as well. So Southern European party systems like the Spanish one now get also radical right parties as we have known them in Northwestern Europe for quite a while. And uh, you have in uh, Southern Europe now similar kind of party system structures as illustrated by Spain as in the Northwest of Europe, confirming the very big importance of the conflict between the nationalist conservatives represented by Vox and by the uh, Partito Popular on the one hand and uh, the cosmopolitan liberals uh, represented by, I would say, Ciudadanos and uh, PSOE. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, some people have put forward a much more pessimistic view that, uh, in fact, there are doubts about the effectiveness of democracy as a technology for government based on the experience of some countries like China and based on the uh, growing dissatisfaction among the young people uh, with democracy. You don't find evidence of it? I mean, you refer to the growing dissatisfaction with democracy among young people. You refer to a very uh, much cited article by Foa and Munch. Uh, Yasha, Yasha Munch. Exactly. This is a prime example of very poor scholarship. And unfortunately, this poor scholarship is cited by everybody. Now, I don't want to go into the details of why this poor scholarship. Well, it would be good to tell us. Yes. Uh, first of all, what do these people do? They cheat you with their graphs. So uh, they don't, the graphs presentation don't have a zero point. Secondly, they don't realize that the composition of uh, the different country samples in Europe change over time. So that they do a compositional mistake. Third, they interpret a period effect as a generational effect. Uh, and fourth, they show with some justification that the young generations in the United States are less supportive of democracy. In Europe, this is not the case. Even their own graph shows that for Europe, the relationship between age cohorts and support for democracy is curvilinear. So it is the younger who, for the question, how important is it for you to live in a country that is a democracy, the youngest and the oldest are somewhat less supportive of democracy. But if you go into the details and you want to find out what about the youngest it is exactly that uh, is the problem, you will see that in the Nordic countries, they are mainly indifferent. They don't care so much. They are satisfied with what they get, but they don't care. In Southern Europe, they are mainly critical. So they care, but they are extremely dissatisfied, like the Indignados or uh, the Greek, uh, I, I, I cannot pronounce how they are called, but the Greek equivalent of the Indignados showed very clearly, or as Cinque Stelle shows. Cinque Stelle is a party of mainly young people, and these parties give expression not to lack of support for democracy, but of critique of the really existing democracy from the point of view of Democrats. Thank you. My name is Magda Vasari. I have a Italian name, but also I am coming from Slovakia. My questions would be, uh, Slovakia is, in, uh, is a only member of the Eurozone uh, among the V4 countries. Do we have any possibility to influence the non-democratic or illiberal tendencies in, uh, uh, among our neighbors in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, or in Poland? Do you see the possibility that we can help influence it with the help of the pro-democratic forces from the West? 
It's, it's a very hard question to answer. As I already said, the external linkage and leverage within the EU with respect to governments that are illiberal within the EU is very difficult. But it is not impossible. And uh, for example, if the European People's Party would get its act together and would uh, really proceed to sanction the deviant governments, I think it would make a difference. You suggest that the mobilization could come from below, that uh, grassroots movements would uh, be of importance in influencing these governments. I don't think so. I think the pressure has, come, has to come from the elites, from, from, from above. And there are, I think, uh, actors and instruments uh, which could be used, but which are, for the time being, not used as much as they should. Corina Stratola, the European Policy Center, Brussels. Um, you mentioned how this uh, type of political parties um, highlight um, people's frustration and give voice to real problems, right? To what ails the people. However, oftentimes, uh, these kind of political parties don't have the solutions. And if they don't have the solutions, and uh, if the alternatives that they propose are not really feasible and won't address the source of the problem, uh, which has to do with uh, the people losing uh, their ability to change course um, and to um, um, make use of that self-corrective uh, uh, function of, uh, that makes democracy m more appealing than any other uh, political system, then won't this in the long run end up undermining or eroding actually people's faith and support uh, in democracy. I mean, n maybe not in the, in the first instance, uh, but as these political parties uh, prove unable to resolve the initial problem, then won't it uh, in the long term um, uh, do a disservice to democracy? I think y you are right. If these parties get into power, their recipes for the solution of the problems they raise are not very effective, or in general tend not to be very effective. For example, uh, Takis Papas has uh, done an analysis of the economic policies of populists in power, and it's devastating. The populist economics are really not very helpful. They just hand out money to different kinds of uh, clients. So people will find out that these parties don't do the trick either. And in Central and Eastern Europe, you have the illustration of what happens. So people try different populist uh, parties in a series of elections. They vote out the rascals immediately after one term, and they vo vote in new populist parties, which, again, do not prove to be able to solve the problems. And the result is chronic uh, democratic dissatisfaction. The result is not abandoning of the, uh, the democratic ideals, but it is a chronic dissatisfaction. Okay, I'm uh, told to end this discussion. I would like to thank you very much for the questions. Okay, we'll now, ha now have a very short break. Um, I ask you please to be back in this room by 11.15 or 11.20 um, for the next session so that we start on time. Thank you.
I'd like to invite you to please start taking your seats as the next session will start very shortly.
I'd like to please ask you to start taking your seats. Thank you very much. Please take your seats. Can everyone please take their seats? Please take your seats so that we can get started with the next session. Thank you.
Will everyone please take their seats? Will everyone please be seated? Thank you. We'll be starting in a few minutes, so please take your seats. Thank you.
We're about ready to begin the next session, so please take your seats. This session is entitled The Future of the European Union as a Mission for All of Us. Please take your seats. In the following session, The Future of the European Union as a Mission for All of Us, His Excellency, Mr. Klaus Werner Johannes, President of Romania, will sit for a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Klaus Dieter Frankenberger, the foreign editor of the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Professor Renaud de Hus will offer his introduction. A very good morning to all of you. My name is Klaus Frankenberger, and I'm the foreign editor of the Frankfurt Allgemeine If you allow me, I will. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. You, you see that, Mr. President, how eager we are <laughs> to hear what you have to say. But I wouldn't want this session to start without really expressing our gratitude as European University Institute for your having found the time of uh, this trip to Florence. We know how busy your agenda is. We know how demanding a period this is in Romanian politics and how important is uh, the, the work that uh, you have been uh, conducting ahead of the CBU meeting. So uh, we are really extremely grateful for that. Uh, I just want to emphasize one key point in uh, uh, let's say, explaining the nature of this uh, event, which is uh, our uh, nature as uh, a true transnational uh, academic institution. It's important, I think, to stress that uh, we exist only because of our member states, of their strong commitment, not only to Europe in general, but to uh, the Europe of higher education. And we are extremely proud of having uh, Romania as one of our members uh, now uh, for a number of years. It's important uh, for us to stress that uh, we are uh, not only a uh, European institution in the abstract sense, uh, but we are European because of our strong ties with our member states. We are, in a way, uh, a kind of Western outpost of uh, the Romanian academic world, uh, and uh, we very much uh, intend to reinforce this uh, feature of our activities in the years to come. So I leave the floor to the conversation and uh, wish you a pleasant stay in Florence. Thank you. So the second try again, my name is Klaus Frankenberger. Our, it's been a great pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to be at the Palazzo Vecchio, it's wonderful to be in Flor Florence, and it's wonderful to be in Italy. I'm proud that my paper is associated with this event and with the institution now for the fifth, fifth year. It gives us uh, great pleasure, and I said it's an honor for us to be part of this event. It gives me even greater pleasure, and uh, I'm proud to be with you, Mr. President, on the stage, the President of Romania for roughly four and a half years now. You, you have been a mayor of the city of Sibiu, Hermannstadt. Um, you have been a national politician and now a strong voice uh, in the European arena. The President, President Johannes, is a staunch defender of the independence of the legal system, and he is an unwavering fighter 
against corruption, if I may say this as an outside observer. In three weeks, we have the European elections. Some people say this is Europe's rendezvous with destiny. I don't know if this is a little bit too much of drama, it's over-dramatized, but it tells you what is at stake. The world outside, out there is nasty, turbulent, voters are volatile. There are ugly social forces gnawing at the social fabrics of our societies. International challenges, demographic, geoeconomic, technological, environmental. So there's a lot, of, lot out there. Um, people feel threatened by change and by the plethora of changes. And um, I hope you, Mr. President, will help us chart a way out of this plethora of insecurity and concern of the people. This event today deals with democracy, one of the key elements of our form of governments. And the previous session explicitly asked the, the question, is democracy, uh, is there concern for democracy? I would like to start this conversation and pass the question on to you. Do we have to be concerned with our way of democracy? Is it under attack? Is it under threat by the illiberal forces out there, by voters' alienation? Thank you. Um, let me start by answering. You know, our democracy is not under threat. But before I elaborate uh, a little bit on this, uh, uh, let me say good morning, buongiorno. Thank you for the very warm welcome here. I had the occasion together with the mayor to visit this extraordinary beautiful building here. And I think this, this shows, in fact, a significant part of our common heritage. And it is not so much about the color or about the space, it's about daring. Our history was led by people who dared more. So let's go back to that. And if we dare more, we will prevail. Uh, no, I do not believe uh, that our democracy is under threat. But yes, our democracy is under stress. And uh, in, in Romania, we have uh, a very complicated internal situation. And uh, quite often, people come and ask me, well, is democracy in Romania under threat? Is it, is it an in, endangered? Uh, is, is the society in danger? And they say, no. But we have a very lively democracy. And uh, I, I think this is what we, uh, what we have uh, in Europe. We're, we have upcoming elections. And a lot of politicians fear these elections because uh, populists uh, uh, will win a lot of votes. Uh, uh, Eurosceptics are on the rise. But this should not scare us. This should encourage us, us the politicians who believe in Europe, in integration in Europe, in a strong Europe. It should make us become even stronger and find ways to convince the Europeans that we have a good future and that we, the politicians, know how to build that future. So definitely, democracy is not under threat, but we have to be stronger and better. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is our good news. Our, and I also take the first lesson away. We need courage to move forward. This may be a banality, but still, it's an important message. Second, we need to reduce stress. You say democracy is not under stress, but still, see, in my, in my national parliament, we have about 100 hard right members now in the German Bundestag. This doesn't give me no pleasure at all, and I don't think this is a normal situation. Um, how can we reduce the concerns of the people or those 
anxieties that fuel the rise of populists and neo-nationalists, that it cannot be disputed that both populism and neo-nationalism at has at least uh, reached new levels of political significance in many countries. As you said in, in your opening statement, we, we have multiple crises in Europe. Um, Brexit, migration, uh, sort of unemployment, border security, terrorism is a threat which became more and more uh, uh, inflicting on our societies. And many others we, we don't even mention anymore, uh, the economic threats, uh, uh, globalization, uh, divergent uh, approaches uh, if it comes to, to free trade and so on and so forth. So people do hear in the news that we have problems. Uh, they hear about great changes they feel that they are not, not so important anymore, and all this creates insecurity. Now, if we really want to fight insecurity, or if we want to make our Europeans optimistic again, we have to go to the basis of this. I mean, all these crises together, what do they trigger? inside a citizen of the old Europe or of the new Europe? Uh, th does it trigger just fear of the future? Uh, does it trigger existential fears? Does it trigger s fears linked to security? Or to, does it trigger fear of losing our democracy? Does it trigger fear of losing our common European values. Well, I think it's a little bit of everything, but uh, as I have been asked this question uh, quite often, uh, let me say right from the start that in the old Europe and in the new Europe, the fears are not, not identical. And th this has to be taken into account. Uh, if we look at old Europe, Western Europe. I think if it comes to the basics, people fear that they will lose what they have. They fear that tomorrow they will have less than today. If we go to the new Europe, uh, former Eastern, con Eastern countries, it's not the same. People in Eastern Europe rather fear that they will be left behind. They fear that they will not have tomorrow what the, what the old Europe has today. So it, it's quite different, and this makes it uh, virtually impossible to treat it everything in the same way. So we have to find local, regional, not only answers, we have to find solutions because otherwise uh, our citizens will not believe us. So if it comes to what we have to do to be credible, we have to come up with projects for the future. And this is why I believe that uh, the upcoming summit in Sibiu, which will be held next week, uh, Interesting enough, exactly on the 9th of May, Day of Europe. This is not a coincidence. It was intended to be like this. The summit is very important because it is maybe the first time we have a summit dedicated to the future of Europe. Future of Europe. Of course, we hear a lot of phrases quite often. We hear a lot of politicians talking about the future of Europe. We hear a lot of politicians saying, we have to be close to the citizen again. We have to react to the citizen's needs. Well, this sounds very good, but 
What is it? Well, this is what we are trying to find. What is it? What do we have to actually do? What do we have actually to create to give our citizens back their optimism, hope for future, and action for future? Because if we don't act, if we just complain, we will lose it. We will lose everything. And I, I believe in the European Union. I do not want to lose it. I want to make it stronger. I want to make it better prepared for the future. And I want to make it resilient. No matter what comes, we have to deal with it. But I want to make sure that we know how to deal with it. Thank you for this wonderful, optimistic, optimistic um, interpretation. I take away this as the second lessons of this, of our little conversation here. Do not exclude the people, politically, socially, and economically, because they're then easy prey for the scapegoats and put all the blame on, on the EU. So when I understand you correctly, Mr. President, you say Romania is a lively debate, but there are, there are no signs that some elements, some parts of the government system, the judicial system is under threat by forces that are on the corruption side a little bit. Is all okay? You are the bulk work against taken over by certain elements in your country? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. We'll see that. The uh, history book will tell us if, if I managed it or not. But I'm certainly trying. The situation is very complicated in Romania. I, I don't want to, to paint it uh, more pinkish than it is in reality. We have, uh, we have uh, the independence of just, justice under threat. We have populistic approaches. We have uh, all kind of complicated situations. And if uh, we talk about the architecture of, uh, of our political system, we have something we call a hard cohabitation between the president and the governing majority. So this, this all uh, sounds matter-of-factly, but uh, it, it is really very complicated and it is stressing for the citizens, for the public systems, and uh, I, I think that uh, we will have to have very soon a clear answer from our citizens, and we will have, because we have now European elections, and in parallel I called for a uh, public vote for referendum. We will have uh, presidential elections in November this year, and next year we will have parliamentary elections. So the Romanians will answer will come with answers for the situation. Uh, and I'm very optimistic that they will come up with the right answer, but that's uh, something we will see after we have uh, our results. The fact that societies are in turmoil, that democracy is under stress and populism on the rise is something we have to see and we have to react to it. But the reaction cannot be of the same type. Populists become popular, as the word says, because they come up with very simple answers for very complicated problems, but they never deliver. But as we have our democracy, it takes one mandate, at least till uh, the society reacts and says, well, they promised they didn't de deliver, so we will not elect them again. This is why the political parties, the established political parties, have to come up with real answers for really complicated questions and with good projects. The only thing which will not function is imitating the populists. If we imitate the populists, then of course we will become like them, not they like us. And this is not going to be a solution for any of our problem. So see the problem, tackle it, bring, come up with a project and put it into practice. This is what I understand that politician has to do. And this is what I tried ever since I entered uh, politics in the year 2000 create projects, put them into practice, tell people, look, this was the problem, this was my project, this is what I've done. 
And if I may add, don't be shy of political dialogue and, 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 and debate with your op political opponents. Well, things have to be discussed and you, you have to talk about it. You have to talk about projects, but you also have to talk about results. And if I may say, this is one of the major issues where the European Union failed. The European Union is a huge, a positive, very good project, very strong project. And we achieved so much. The European Union has an impact on each of your life and each of the European citizens' lives, and a positive impact, a continuous positive impact. Every research shows that the Union led to a better life, to a safer life, to security in Europe. But guess what? More often than not, we forget to tell the Europeans about this. We concentrate on the crisis and forget about the positive results. We continue, we, we talk w without end about, for instance, Brexit. This is the theme we talk about Brexit for three years now. Well, it is a problem, of course, and we have to sort it out. But during these years, we forgot to talk about the economic results, about the single market, about the progress we made, about competitivity in Europe, about the future of Europe. If we continue to talk only about the crisis and the threats and not about the solutions, people will be scared. And this is not what we want to do. I would think most, if not all people in this room would strongly subscribe to every word you just said. But then still the question is, the question is, is here, why is it so easy if the EU is so good for us, so important, or in terms of security, in terms of economic welfare and so forth, commerce, travel, or mobility, labor mobility for most of us, if not all. Why is it so easy then to demonize the EU? Why is it so easy to bash those who are associated uh, with you? including the chattering classes, including myself. Why is it so easy to demonize the EU and bring attraction out there, out of this room, for example? I have two, ma two, two major answers to this, or two major reasons, plus a lot of secondary reasons, which I, I will not, uh, uh, I will not uh, mention because it will lead us too far. Uh, one of the reasons you, as a journalist, know perfectly well. And the fact is that almost no European citizen knows personally or meets personally European politicians. Just a few people meet a few politicians directly. Most Europeans get their information through the media. And this is very good. We have a free press. Apropos today, I think is that day of the free press, so who's from the media, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> but, but the media has certain rules. One of those is unfortunately good news is no news. Bad news is sensation. So if you open a newspaper, a TV, whatever, sometimes you hear good news, but most times you hear about a crisis, a flood, a bombing, an uprising, about something difficult, threatening crisis. Very, not so often you hear about, uh, for instance, the single market has been growing and created a uh, uh, better state of the union through a better uh, competitivity. You, you don't hear that on the news. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, this doesn't mean that we have to change the media. We just have to change the way we politicians depict things, how we create the image. If we manage to create sort of a positive image, it will be used by the media. Second, the second problem are the politicians themselves. You and I and most of you probably know politicians who go to Brussels 
and say, everything's fine. We have a good union, we have a strong union, and we will continue. But then elections come up and they go home. And the elector asks, well, Mr. Politician, why didn't you do whatever? Why didn't you construct that road? And the politicians say, well, those from Brussels didn't let me. So blaming the union at home is very common. And as long as we have, not everybody's doing this, but as long as we have a lot of politicians who say, if we meet among politicians, the union is good, and then they go home and say, the union is not so good, or the union did not help us, or it's the union fault, of course, people become unsecure and ask, well, what's happening if our politician says the union creates problem for my country, for my community, then this is a problem. So we not only have to create projects and to, to design our future, we have as politicians to be quite honest and say, okay, if the union created an opportunity and we managed to move things in the right direction. We have to say that. But if we fail with the project, we have to say, well, sorry, it was not a good project. Or I didn't know how to put it into practice. But not always try to blame uh, the, the, the Brussels establishment. They have their flaws, no matter what we talk. But we don't have to blame them for everything. The good news is that we find that our, the interest of our readers, of television viewers in, in my country, in, uh, in European affairs and European issues is increasing, quite dramatically so. This has been since the Euro, the debt crisis, but this has not gone away. I have that's to a, say that's a very good news. I, I have to say a word to the, to the organizers here. There's something wrong with that clock. It runs down much too fast. So. You must, how must be broken. reset it somehow. Um, three day, two days ago, actually, um, on May 1st, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of the admission of 10 countries to the EU. Your country and Bulgaria followed a few years, years thereafter. By all means, enlargement, in my judgment, has been a success. Has been a success. And I would not are disputed for a second. Nevertheless, we see something what politicians, journalists like myself call enlargement fatigue. Again, this is also not disputable that this exists. In your judgment, Mr. President, what is the way forward when we, when we look at the Western Balkan countries? Well, uh, you start talking about the enlargement. I, I think this was uh, a major step for my country, or the major step for my country over the last uh, decades, and it was certainly a major positive step. And this is how I see uh, enlargement, the last waves of enlargement. They not only improved the situation for the new countries, it also, the, the enlargement also was significant progress for the Union, for old Europe. So uh, if, if people say, well, you know, accession was good for your country, but then I answer, okay, it was good for your country too. It was good for both countries because it made the union bigger, stronger, and more competitive. So we have to continue. We have to continue the enlargement. We have the Western Balkans waiting to be accepted. We have, we have to make our union not only larger, but we have to make it stronger. And by making it stronger, I, I do not uh, understand only making its economy stronger. I also understand making its security better making its procedures easier for the Europeans and having a better integration. You see, we have in Europe two 
different approaches among politicians. Some, and I admit I'm one of those, say we have to go towards a stronger integration, a better integration, and make the union stronger in itself than it will be strong towards the outside too, and can become, for instance, a strong global actor. Others say, no, we don't need that. We need to keep our sovereignty. We need to keep our national competences at home and work together on certain projects. That's, that's uh, not my opinion, but I admit there are a lot of relevant European polit politicians having this approach. So this is the ongoing discussion now about the architecture and about the future of Europe. Do we have to be stronger together or do we have to be one near the other and not integrated? So if you ask me, I'm pro-integration and I think this is the path for a stronger Europe. Being better integrated means that if we accept new members, we have to fully integrate them too, and this is the way how I see the union becoming stronger. I, I'm, I'm sure you told the British Prime Minister your view that uh, staying together is better than uh, being alone and weaker. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't want to ask you about your views on the Brexit, it, and if it's going to happen at all, who knows. Um, but what did we learn? What did the rest of the EU, the EU27, learn from the vote of the British and particularly the English voters in 2016? Have we done anything to review a reform agenda? What, what is the lessons that we need to learn from Brexit? Well, one lesson we certainly have to learn from Brexit is that we have to give the Europeans uh, a feeling of security, of safety, and that they matter. This, this is important nowadays. We, we do not have any more societies where people don't care so much if they matter or not. Today, people want to matter. They want their vote to count, to be important. And this is also part of what I see the future of the Union. Being closer to the citizens does not necessarily mean physically closer. I can meet a lot of people, but I, I will never be in a position to meet everybody. But on the other hand, Europeans want to have a strong connection with the politicians that l lead the union. Having a strong connection means voting. So we need more positions up for voting. We have to give the European citizens the possibility to vote directly for important positions. For the time being, none of the position we have leading positions in the European Union is voted by the people. It's an indirect democracy we have, and I think this is one of the problems we, uh, we face now. This was probably part of the problem with the Brexit, because those people said, well, what do we control? They didn't feel that they controlled what's happening in their own country. Of course, this is linked to what we discussed before. We, we managed to put into practice so many projects, but we didn't talk about those projects. We didn't show the people what we did, how we did it, and what's the next step. We did not explain where the union wants to go. It is true, we have a lot of regulations, but most of them are so technical that the citizens don't care. They don't understand these regulations, despite the fact that they are important. So we have to talk more about the future, more about what each citizen can do and why the vote of each citizen counts. This is, in my opinion, making a, a, a stronger link, relinking the politicians to the Europeans. As our time is about to be up now, I would like to move one step further onto the international arena. What is, in your view, 
the greatest challenging, the greatest uh, challenges, um, the greatest challenge faces the EU. Is it Russia's hybrid activities, Russia's aggressiveness in Eastern Europe? Is it America's our disruption and America first policies undermining Western coherence? Or is it China's geopolitical and particularly geoeconomic assertiveness in the world? Well, I think, ev I think everything is important. Uh, it's obvious that as Europeans, we have to deal with Russia. Russia is our neighbor. We, we have to deal with Russia. Uh, it's obvious that we have to come to terms if it comes to trade with the United States because the United States is our most important partner and this is not, not only in economics, it's in, it's in security. We have, to, we have to think about NATO and about what we did together and what we can do together. NATO is the strongest alliance ever. So we have to come to terms. We have to find ways to deal with China and so on and so forth. So we have to deal with all these issues. It's obvious that the world is evolving from a bipolar global situation from the Cold War to a multipolar situation. And guess what? I really want the union to be an important actor. I want the Union to, to be one of the important poles in a multipolar world. And this is right now not the case. Unfortunately, the Union is extremely strong economically. But if it comes to world politics, our voice is not strong enough. We still have a, a weak voice. And this is what I believe has to change dramatically. The European Union really has to become a global actor, starting from its obviously strong economic position and building on this. So we have a pretty long path to go till we become a relevant global actor again. But we can do it and we should do it. This, this is a wonderful final statement. I will not add anything to it uh, other than simply saying maybe it's really true that this is the time when Europe faces, has a rendezvous with its destiny. Um, please join me in thanking President Johannes for wonderful insights optimistic and hopeful remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. President.
We'll now start our next session, please. I'm now happy to open the next session. Uh, Professor Renaud de Hoos, president of the UI, will now give his introduction to our next guest, France's Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, Jean-Yves Le Drian. Monsieur le Ministre, uh, Minister, it's an honor for us to welcome you for this event between France and Florence. We said that yesterday. There's this fine symbol of this city. Um, this is shown well by this. Florence is very proud of holding the greatest French institute in the world, which had its centenary last year. and. Last but not least, France is also one of the reference shareholders, to use a rather modern, more modern terminology, of the European in University Institute. Allow me a word about this uh, a particular institution in its specifics, as some often not well understood. The Institute is an international organization, but it's also a transnational cross-border institution for teaching and research. Uh, that, that what is so original about it and the interest in it, it is both an institution that has strong roots in the, the territory, which welcomes it with such generosity, but it's also, as I said to, to President Ioannis, it's an institution that wishes to be representative of the originality and the culture of this diff of these different member states. It is at the same time French, German, and Italian, and also strongly launched into the building of a pan-European network. We have some considerations. This is prefiguring the idea of a European university to which the President of the Republic has given a new boost with his talk at the Sorbonne. But conferences like this, we try to bring our contribution or discussions about the most thorny issues of European construction. The subject chosen for this year is that of democracy in the century that has just begun. And this is so current that I think nobody would doubt this. Nobody would question it. We know that Europe is crossing through an unusual moment, a moment when it is there are plenty of disputes in many countries and protests with no exception by now. And for some time now, the idea of leaving it seems to have lost its credibility. But this unease, this malaise is well, it's real. And we are having this experimentation, this political laboratory. We had the honor yesterday to welcome one of the rare di uh, discussions, debates amongst the Spitzenkandidaten. And this is one of the original features of this European political structure. We are at a key moment. The, the old and the new must discuss between each other, and that explains our impatience in awaiting your contribution to this debate. Thank you so much for the, uh, uh, giving us the honor of coming here today. Bien, Monsieur le Président, 
Mesdames et Messieurs. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm feeling emotional to talk before you about Europe in this beautiful place, this beautiful city of Florence, which is both the cradle of the Renaissance and the cradle of European modernity. In the treatises of, uh, by Machiavelli and the paintings by Botticelli, the in the midst of conspiracies and revolts which took place here, a part of our history developed here in the outbursts that still inspire us and the surges and the hopes which gather us together always. It's our conviction that of the President of the Republic, that of the French government, that's it's time for a new European renaissance has come. It's a message that President Macron wished to address to all the citizens of the Union in his letter in the month of March, talking to them directly about our vision of Europe and addressing all citizens because it's indispensable. There's nothing deep, there's nothing lasting will be done without them. And the, the previous debate shows this. It's also the message that I came here to, br to bring you today. You who are trying hard to make the European debate come alive, you who in this European Institute uh, uh, remind us of the picture of the State of the Union, and I wanted to say this in particular because we saying this together, Europe is uh, at a crossroads and the elections of, in May will be decisive we there will be we will see the real dividing lines come into the open between those who want to stop Europe and those who wish to make it advance those between those who are satisfied with slogans and those who seek solutions between those who are selling dreams and those who look at the world in the face so with you i think we agree with this conviction that uh, looking at these risks and these threats and these dangers, which could be fatal. It's not too late to act. That's the optimistic message of President Ioannis just now has shown us this. But it's not too late to act as long as we are awake, awake to the dangers. This first danger is that of division. The centrifugal forces crossing our continent have found in the referendum that uh, decided for Brexit uh, uh, about three years ago now, their sad grand finale. And the British people discovered behind the lies and the false promises, the uncertainty and the fear for tomorrow. And the United Kingdom must take difficult choices, which are painful. We will continue to seek, together with the British, the best possible arrangement, but we fear that um, this, we cannot accept that Brexit, Brexit will end up uh, bringing the union behind it with all its eddies. It's not a question of adopting a punitive view towards the United Kingdom, of which we are very we are, we are very sorry about its defection, but it's one of our responsibilities to assure that the willing departure of the United Kingdom should not weaken the capacity, decision-making capacity of the Union, European Union. And we need to be united in this negotiation, 27 of us. And the positive aspect of this crisis is this, this unite, unity which has been maintained. It's one of our best assets. And uh, that's why I think that the will of President Ioannis putting this imperative of cohesion at the heart of the Romanian presidency is a symptom of this need. But beyond today's negotiations that we hope will could l lend 
uh, quickly. We hope that all the lessons from the British withdrawal uh, should not be a signal, a sign, a signal of alarm, which would condemn us to repeating the past errors and allowing the bonds between us to be broken. Because our union, that's the second danger, is also weakened by these ill winds that here are making the values of the rule of law totter. These values uh, which and these ill winds which agitate the flames of uh, which becomes something which rekindles the flame of populism. As we should say, we learn all the lessons from Brexit, we should consider the increase of populisms in Europe as uh, for what it is. It's a symptom of a deep malaise. The symptom, this malaise about distance, uh, as President Ioannis said, between the, the, the institutions and the citizens, but also this malaise for about this globalization, which affects our people in full force about the in inequalities in our societies, between them, and they're in the daily life of each of us, and there are these convulsions of an unstable and dangerous world. Yes, the threats of terrorism, the specter of trade war, and the premises of a climate catastrophe are all worrying. And the, the, the fact of having the digitization is something which exists, but that's not bringing solutions to these challenges. On the contrary, abandoning the tools of which we most need is the paradox of populism, which proposes as a form of solution, pretending to be solutions to problems, but it doesn't try to solve. It, all it does is worsen these. So we are in this absurd logic, because looking at the rhetor of these logics of the ratio of powers, the power balance, in looking at the deregulation and the questioning of the multilateral system and the global nature of the major challenges which are facing our societies, uh, how could we imagine this belongs to each state on its own? That's the big challenge of the future elections. How could we imagine that we will give up this will for multilateral regulation of the big transnational challenges which mark the 21st century, or we got to escape from this need uh, if we do not take up this vocation, and Europe will disappear from history because this would become, if it becomes our choice, whether this will exist in the historic future. Populism is. The, the third danger, the fact of losing our landmarks, our points of reference, Europe is not cynicism and indifference. The European project means the collective research for solutions, and it's particularly true for the question of asylum and migrations, which involves both our values and our capacity to take up the challenge, um, one of the greatest challenges for our future or living it together in each of our countries and in Europe. These solutions exist because these scenes of the previous summers, for, for them not to, to, be, to be repeated, we must at the same time consolidate Frontex and set up a European Asylum Bureau to harmonize our practices and reinforce European solidarity in welcoming refugees who have a right to asylum and to ensure the return of those who cannot claim it. There, these are the possible orientations, uh, looking at uh, what our will is, but the sy symptoms of the loss of landmarks, of points of reference, is a symptom of this disquiet about the capacity of the European Union to talk uh, within and without in a single voice about the fundamental rights, the European motto. Uh, united in diversity does not mean that each can, uh, by virtue of national specificities, that prevent the European Union from expressing itself on the principles and the values which are so fundamental as that of human rights, migrants, and human and reproductive rights. So we've got this threefold crisis, crisis of representation, so social and crisis and crisis of values. And our responsibility is not only to 
denounce these sophisms and these simplistic connections when we, when, which populism used to extort the support of people, but to respond in depth to the European malaise and the mortal fatal crisis which is awaiting it. If the sense of the European Renaissance, uh, which uh, France calls about its wills and works in, uh, to make it happen, the Renaissance of this city, which bears witnesses, was first the movement of the return of the classics. That is, we have to find the fundamentals of the European project. First of all, the horizon of social progress. We've got to relink again with the care for protection, which inspired our common policies, the oldest and the most emblematic of them. Before, in order to fight against dumping within the Union, we need a real social uh, shield, that is to say, a threshold, a minimal threshold for protection, which would be benefit to the workers and all European citizens, those who are employed by the chiefs of heads of state and the government in Gothenburg. We must be aware. We must take, be aware of this situation, which can condition the payment of the European structural funds or respecting the social, essential social standards, which we have discussed together. Secondly, the Renaissance also means giving the floor to citizens to find these fundamentals of the European project. This idea that President Ioannis was referring to the summit uh, about the future of the Union, the, the 6th to the 9th of May in Cebu, this is the first time that this summit will deliberate about the future of the European Union um, on the basis of contributions of citizens' consultations, which have been launched in the preparatory phase, and it's a sign of what will happen in the future. Finally, and above all, ladies and gentlemen, we must assert and reinforce European sovereignty. Europe needs a vision, a long-term vision, and to assert its own identity and its power. During the last few months, advances, considerable advances have been made in the domain of defense, European defense. I'm thinking of the European Intervention uh, Defense Initiative. And we think of the Atlantic Alliance, and we must con continue to affirm, assert this sovereignty, which is st strategically important to reach a European treaty for defense and security. We need common security, but need to reinforce in the same way the ceiling of s safety, protection, uh, for our citizens, for European sovereignty, there must also be more, more asserted economically, industrially, technologically, and commercially. Here, I would point out the first progress of our collective assertion towards the United States and to China in this big battle fought for the regulation of world trade. We must examine this movement and deepen it in order to ensure world balances. We've been doing this uh, firstly with our allies, the United States, but this great country today, which in history has uh, oscillated between isolationism and the will to be implied in the affairs of the whole world and to interfere in the affairs of the whole world, seem to be questioning foundations of the multilateral mechanisms. We deplore uh, oh, there's no mystery here. We will continue to fight for to comfort this transatlantic relations and its future with a partnership and at the same time on the respecting values. The work on world balances, we need to engage with China too, and we must do it without being naive. We know well, for example, that uh, important matters in as such as investments in China uh, on our continent. We know well that Beijing has played in our divisions and we I observe that for some months now the work of the Commission 
has validated by the chiefs, heads of state and governments, has recent clarified our position with China and has confirmed our sovereignty. We no longer hesitate to collectively recognize that China is for us a systemic rival. We are in a situation in which we can say that China is an economic com competitor technologically. We know that Beijing has become uh, a partner without whom nothing could be solved, nor neither in the matter of climate, nor in the economy, nor in multilateralism. But we must assert the role of Europe as a global player and have this partnership which is competitive and creating a partnership at the same time with China. It's a Europe who asserts, which asserts its sovereignty, must at the same time be assured of its actors on a, in a global plane. We must be open to our new partnerships with Africa in order to promote the development of this continent through investments with the, in the framework of the revising the Cotonou agreements. And we must have the necessary means for maintaining peace. And we need to act together as Europeans in this new strategy for Africa as we are doing, we've been doing in the previous years in a partnership with Germany in particular. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, this more united Europe to protect its citizens, this more dem democratic Europe, this more sovereign Europe that the President Macron called uh, uh, in September in his address at the Sorbonne. It's a Europe which will allow us to be to impose our presence on the international scene as a power for innovation and regulation. Our continent has solutions to propose to reply to the great challenges of our times. And it's that time which is uh, that the world knows it. Having said that, um, following the model of the Renaissance, not only r coming back to the classics, but to to rely on them, to form a new world. We know there's uh, regulation on, and innovation and new technologies. We're in the middle of a revolution, the revolution of, of data, the revolution of new media, the revolution of artificial intelligence. We risk um, a new type of threat, which is the risks of uh, new types of uh, opportunities and risks and the threats of a new type, that is, mastering the social networks and the internet uh, by terrorists and criminal groups, and that is new forms of monopolies which can capture an unequal part of the value created by our economies. It is a risk, but it's a chance, it's an opportunity, because we can take up this challenge, and there we have this co capacity for regulation. We need to show our citizens that we are able to regulate in the face of all the innovations that appear, in particular, in the new technologies. And we need to invest together for so that Europe will both be the cradle of some technologies, but also models for regulation. This that leads to Leonardo da Vinci 500 years ago. He followed new technologies, but he, there was, is the need for regulation. Concerning regulation and innovation, our great challenge should, must be that of proposing new rules to maintain uh, the struggle for the environment. We must act together with our partners to uh, uh, prevent this environmental disaster that threatens us. And we Europeans must be in a situation of innovation and um, regulation. We must have pragmatic and innovative uh, proposals f in order for the Paris Agreement be something that should be the concrete, um, substantive translation of, our, of these proposals. So the power of regulation and innovation that we hope to see in the Europe of the future, it's also the assertion of a Europe at the head of the defense of the multilateral systems. The Europeans must work together to prevent work from 
being launched against the major institutions built at the end of the Second World War. Certain, certainly, these world balances have evolved greatly since then, which leads needs for corrections and improvements in the international system. But we must be a reliable partner for those partners who those wish for international order, that it should be based on law and cooperation, which are recognized as the values and the human prin humanist principles which are at the heart of our political project. They are numerous, and they, and they count on us everywhere in the world. And their hopes uh, oblige us to act. We act also to modernize multilateralism in trade and develop new collective disciplines, and also to ensure uh, more loyal competi competition uh, on a world scale. There, ladies and gentlemen, the project for Europe has never been in our history uh, beset by so many doubts. These doubts, there's only by action that we can remove them. We act to reinforce the cohesion in our union, acting to find the fundamentals for the European construction and to assert the power of Europe on the international scene. From Athens to Florence yesterday in the 27 states that compose, which will compose our union tomorrow, Europe has not ceased and must not cease to be reborn in itself. That is what makes history, uh, makes history great, uh, which brings us together. And that's also, I think, the chief, uh, the I'm sorry, the key of our common destiny. I thank you. I have some information regarding lunch today. Conference participants may proceed downstairs to the Cortile della Dogana for a buffet lunch, so that's the exit to the right. Speakers, on the other hand, should leave the room at the left-hand exit from where you will be escorted to the Sala della Musica for the speaker's lunch. Your participation in that lunch is indicated by a red dot on your badge. We also ask you to please remove all personal items from this room as the seating will change in the afternoon. The first afternoon session will start promptly at 2 p.m. with no delays. So I invite you to please start returning to the Salone del Cinquecento at around 1.45. Thank you.